Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sure you've already been welcomed to Manchester. You're almost in Manchester, even though everything around here is countryside. Um, this is very convenient for me because I live about 10 minutes away by car. Uh, so, so I had breakfast at home this morning and still got here before most of you. Um, this morning, um, in this first talk, uh, I'm going to, I've been briefed to tell you my thoughts on future developments in microprocessor design. Um, I've been involved in some way in microprocessor design since the early 1980s, um, but I'm not a core microprocessor designer, so I'm kind of, kind of whoops, that, that's ruined the video. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm, I'm commenting on this from the outside. But anyway, here's the plan for the talk. Um, firstly, you're in Manchester, so I'm going to tell you something about the history of Manchester computing, uh, because the university where I work and where Dave works um, has been building computers uh, since the very early days. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my background and, and, and why I'm here uh, speaking to this subject. Um, and, and give you some key overviews uh, over where computers have, have, have come in the sort of just over a half century that they've uh, existed. Then get on to uh, the factors that affect microprocessor design. Uh, I guess everybody in the room has heard of Moore's Law. Um, and predict the future. Okay, now this is very difficult. Um, it's always speculative um, and, you know, I'm not that much better placed than anybody else to, to guess what's going to happen. Uh, it's a characteristic of our business um, that everybody is surprised by what happens, uh, even the people who think they know. Um, there are many historic quotes, of course. There was the, the historic quote of the senior director of IBM back in the 1960s who th predicted that five computers would be enough for the world for the future. Um, and uh, we'll see that there are rather more than five around now. Um, and, and because this is a human brain project uh, meeting, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role that I think um, that understanding the brain and building models of the brain may play in, in the wider future of computing. So that's the plan. Um, I'm expecting to talk for about an hour. Um, and then I think there's, there's half an hour uh, for questions and discussions, and then a coffee break. Is that right? Yes, good. I've understood the agenda then. That's a good start. So um, let's begin with Manchester. Now, um, Manchester has uh, a significant place in the history of the development of the computer. Um, because it claims to have built the first electronic stored program computer uh, to operate. And this was the Manchester Baby Machine. It's shown here with its two principal designers, Freddie Williams and Tom Kilburn. Uh, they, of course, didn't like this name. Uh, they referred to it as the small-scale experimental machine. Um, the Baby was built just after the Second World War. It was largely built... Um, with war surplus components. Um, so most of the bits in the machine um, had some military use um, before they were salvaged um, after the war to build computers. Uh, the primary technology at the time, of course, was vacuum tubes, um, shown on the left of this picture. But actually, the key technology in the Manchester Baby um, was the thing you see in the middle of this picture, the cathode ray tube. Uh, because Williams and Kilburn's big idea uh, was to use cathode ray tubes for digital storage. In the early days of computing, storing data was the central challenge of building computing machines. Many people knew how to build logic using vacuum tubes, but there were no cost-effective ways of storing data. And if you look at the early machines, you'll see that People used mercury delay lines. They sent data as, um, as, as serial acoustic signals down mercury, and, uh, and they used the slow speed of propagation as storage. So when the signal got to the other end, they picked it up, amplified it, and put it back in the beginning, 
And so the data just went round and round these mercury tubes. Um, and indeed, in this country, at Bletchley Park, um, they are rebuilding the Cambridge machine, EDSAC, which used mercury delay lines. One of their big problems is that mercury is not considered safe today. And therefore, they can't actually rebuild the machine the way it was originally made because mercury is too dangerous now. Um, but anyway, Williams and Kilburn had used cathode ray tubes for analog storage um, for, I think, particularly night radar in the Second World War. And they had this idea that they could use the same technique to store data. And, and so they built a machine that was intended to be a digital data store. And then they thought, how could we test it? And the easiest way they could think of testing it was to build a simple computer around it. Um, and so the Manchester Baby was actually a cathode ray tube storage test rig um, rather than a computer. But it was a programmable computer. You could change the program stored in the cathode ray tube uh, and run it. Now, around that machine, um, the department which Dave and I now work for was constructed. It, it was actually established in the early 60s. Um, and since then, the department's been involved in building machines. And I've picked a small sample of these machines um, to show the significant steps, uh, roughly one per decade. So if we look in the 1950s, there was a machine called the Mark I. This was manufactured by Ferrantes, uh, a company based in North Manchester. And the Ferranti Mark I, based on the Manchester design, was the first commercial stored program computer. Now, what you see here um, looks quite different, but the major difference is that all those nasty high-voltage vacuum tubes have now been safely put behind metal doors. Um, so the machine has been cleaned up, but what's behind those doors is very similar to what you saw in the baby. Um, the other interesting feature of this photo is the person standing to the right, as you see it at the back, is, is Alan Turing, um, who was one of the early users of the Manchester machines. If we go forward a decade, in the 1960s, um, the leading Manchester machine was a machine called the Atlas. And, and, and to my mind, this was the most significant machine uh, designed in the history of Manchester. There were many inventions um, associated with Atlas, one of which, if you're involved at all in computer architecture and engineering, you will know about. Uh, Atlas created, was responsible for the creation of virtual memory. So it was the first machine that virtualized storage in the way that's now universally applied um, in your smartphone, on your PC. And Manchester University held the patents on virtual memory um, in the 1960s. If they still owed those patents today, they would be worth a very large sum of money. Of course, what happened, firstly, patents only last 25 years, so that wouldn't have worked. And secondly, uh, they sold those patents to IBM around 1970 um, for far too little money in the usual British tradition. Um, the Atlas also, uh, now what, what, what were the other inventions? The Atlas was the world's first supercomputer. Um, the target performance was a million instructions a second. Okay, and, and that made it the fastest computer in the world when it was switched on um, in about 1963. Um, the way they achieved this is it was the first machine to use parallel arithmetic. So it had parallel floating point arithmetic circuits built into it. And of course, it represents a technology change. The little picture on the left shows you this was not made using vacuum tubes. It was made using these newfangled devices called transistors. Um, the invention of the transistor is roughly contemporary with the invention of the computer. Um, but of course, technologies have to become reliable and manufacturable. So it was a decade later before transistors found their way into computers. 
If we go another decade um, forward to the 1970s, then Manchester was involved in the design of a mainframe computer in collaboration with the leading British computer company at the time, which was ICL. Now, you've seen those three letters before uh, because my chair at Manchester is the ICL Chair of Computer Engineering. Um, ICL stood for <coughs> International Computers Limited. Um, and it was, if you look at the history of the British computer industry, I, I mentioned Ferranti, there were other companies, English Electric, in the way of these things, they all sort of got merged together and eventually they all collectively became ICL. And ICL was the leading British computer manufacturer um, through to the 1990s um, when it was bought by Fujitsu of Japan. And the Fujitsu, the ex-ICL Fujitsu operation is still very active in the UK. MU5, um, again a decade later, whoops, I've not, I must stand further away from the microphone, otherwise the video will be terrible. Um, MU5 used a new technology, which you see here, and this was the, the microchip. The little black thing at the bottom left corner with many legs um, is quite an early microchip. And in this instance, this microchip would have had uh, a few tens of transistors on it. It would have implemented something like four logic gates, um, a handful of logic gates in a single chip. And now, instead of using transistors individually, uh, we are printing transistors several at a time. MU5 became the prototype of the ICL um, 1900 series of mainframes, um, and that, in fact, was the mainstay of the British computer industry right through to the 1990s. If we go another decade forward, Manchester was heavily involved um, in, a, in a major innovation in parallel computing uh, that was called data flow. And if you study computer science and the history of computing languages, then you see that data flow uh, was very interesting uh, in the 1980s. There was a big activity at MIT in the USA. Um, Manchester was also involved in building machines. And data flow required that you represented your problem in a completely different way. So you had to move right away from sequential languages that did one thing after another and basically express your entire program as a large set of equations, A equals B plus C. And the idea was that you could, you could execute that uh, assignment as soon as you knew the values of B and C. So you think of your program as a huge cloud of equations waiting to be evaluated. But if you don't know, if you know B but you don't know C, you can't do anything. Somewhere else in this cloud, there's an equation that says C equals D times E. That gets evaluated, then you know C, and then you realize you can evaluate A equals B plus C. Um, and you can do as many of these things at the same time as you have the operands for. And this was um, going to be the major breakthrough in computing. Um, we're now far enough after this in history uh, to realize that that breakthrough didn't materialize in the way that the researchers expected, except that if you look at what's happening in any high-end out-of-order microprocessor, what you find is that data flow is being used in the small, not for the whole program, but for a bunch of instructions that are currently about to be executed. You have 20 or 30 instructions in the instruction window and data flow algorithms are used <coughs> to decide what order to execute those in. So this idea which was going to transform the whole of computing um, has had a big influence but not in the way that the researchers expected. And that's actually not unusual in research, that you do something, it's a big idea, it looks like it's going to change the world this way, but in the end it goes a different way. 
Now, the technology used to build the data flow machine, we're a decade later um, than MU5. It's still the microchip shown um, in the small inset here. Um, but now this microchip contains something like a, you know, a four-bit ALU. So it contains hundreds to thousands of transistors. The number of transistors um, has gone up. And we'll be saying quite a lot more about that. Now, as you heard in the introduction, I came to Manchester in 1990. So the next decade is something um, that I was involved in. And during the 1990s, my group at Manchester um, was primarily focused on the design of microprocessors um, using uh, an approach known as asynchronous design. Um, so we built a whole series of microprocessors uh, that were different from mainstream processors in that they didn't have a clock signal. You know, if you look at your computer, this thing has a 2.8 gigahertz Intel, blah, something in it. Um, the 2.8 gigahertz is basically describing a small handle on the side of the processor which is wound, you know, 2.8 thousand million times a second. And every time you wind the handle, something happens. Uh, that's conventional clock design. The amulet processors worked entirely without any clock. Different bits of the processor did things at different times, at different rates, whenever they were ready. And the amulet processors were designed to be code level compatible um, with the ARM instruction set. So they would run ARM programs, but they would do it in this very different operational mode. And now, one thing that's changed is that when you talk about a computer, in the previous slides, you were always talking about a, a circuit board with lots of vacuum tubes, transistors, or chips on. Now the computer has all sort of moved inside the chip. So the thing I brought to Manchester, the new thing I brought, was the idea that computer design is not designing with chips, it's designing the chips themselves. And this was my background from ACORN, as we'll see in a bit. Um, so the basic design components that we're working with now, instead of the little packages with lots of legs on, we're now looking at small VLSI elements. And the inset picture um, on the left-hand side here, if I've read that right, is, is a logic gate. It's something like a, a NAND gate. And the, the, the whole chip is designed by assembling these gates in very large numbers on the surface of the silicon. And then if we go one more decade forward, then we get to uh, the Spinnaker machine that you're probably hearing and seeing quite a lot about, and I will say a bit more about later. Um, but here, we're designing on a scale where we're beginning to think of the basic component as a computer. Okay, so, so in Spinnaker, um, where we're aiming to put a million processors uh, into a single machine, instead of thinking of the components as a vacuum tube or a transistor or a logic gate chip or a piece of VLSI layout, we're tending to think at the level where you know, a whole computer is a component that we're trying to assemble into a larger system. So when we're looking at, at computer design in the future, um, I think the message I want to get over from, from this last section is the idea that, that roughly every decade, the starting point for computer design moves up a level. Okay, so we, we sort of climb up levels of abstraction. And um, that I expect to continue what the next level looks like I have much less idea about. But historically, effectively, you have to sort of step up a layer of abstraction um, in each decade. Now, what's my background in this? Well, you, you, you heard um, about this in the introduction, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. I gather that Dave has also been showing embarrassing movies um, about my earlier life. Only to, only, to, only to exclusive audiences, all right. Okay. Um, so where did I come from? Well, 
Um, uh, among my earliest exposures to computer design was the BBC Micro. Um, this was designed by Acorn Computers in Cambridge, which was a, a small British startup company in, um, in the 1980s that, that got this contract to design the machine with the BBC, which is the British public broadcasting service. And they had decided that computers um, were going to be important. The microprocessor was going to change um, the way people interacted with computers. And their charter uh, includes the education of the public, and they decided they wanted to do something very practical um, with computers. They wanted to produce a series of TV programs about this new mi newfangled microprocessor thing, and they wanted the computer to use with this. And they talked to a, a number of companies, uh, and Acorn secured the contract to build the machine that became the BBC Micro. Now, um, these were very interesting times, the early 1980s, and I remember clearly the early discussions with the BBC where they said that on the back of this program, the company should expect to sell up to 12,000 machines. Okay, that was the estimate. A national TV program, you'll sell 12,000 machines. And, and this was wrong, okay? The number of machines that were sold ended up at about one and a half million. And this was just, just sort of underlines how difficult it was to anticipate the surge of interest in computing that came as soon as computers approached the price bracket where individual people could sensibly think of buying them. Before the 1980s, computers were big things that sat in machine rooms. They were operated by men in white coats. And if you used them, the way you used them was you punched a program on a card deck, you left it in a tray somewhere, you went away for a couple of days, and you came back and got your printout. And the transformation that the microprocessor brought of putting computers in the hands of people, school kids, everybody, um, was very dramatic. We're now after that, so you all take it for granted. Uh, most of the people in the room are too young to remember the world before that. Um, but it was a huge transformation that was nobody anticipated. And the BBC Micro, at least in the UK, um, played a significant role in that transformation. Now this picture is the ACORN marketing department's view of the BBC Micro. Um, I was on the technical side, so this is my view. Um, the, the inside of the machine. What you see here is a fairly large printed circuit board. It has, um, when it's fully fitted, it has 102 microchips on it. The microchips are the little black things, black plastic packages with legs. Um, all chips had legs in those days. Um, this board hasn't got them all fitted. But all of these chips were standard off-the-shelf parts. So if you wanted to design a computer, you went to a catalog of chips, you decided how you wanted to organize them, and you bought the right chips in. So for example, the heart of the BBC Micro um, is that chip in the middle, which looks like all the others, except it's one of the bigger ones, and that's a microprocessor. And that's uh, the microprocessor here is the 6502, an 8-bit micro, the same one that was used by Apple in the Apple II, um, used by Commodore in the Commodore PET, and several other places. A standard chip designed by somebody on the far side of the world, um, in this case in the USA, manufactured there bought and assembled. But on the BBC Micro, there are a couple of these chips which were not off the shelf. Uh, that one and that one, again, they look just like the others. Um, these were chips that we uh, customized for the machine and had manufactured by Ferranti, that name you heard before. Again, they had a small fab in North Manchester. These were uncommitted logic arrays, so they were chips that you could customize just by tuning a single level of metal. And each of these mopped up about 10 or 20 standard chips. So they reduced the number of chips by 10 or 20. 
Um, and th they were my introduction to microchip design. So this would have been in 1981, um, 8081, uh, where I was involved in the specification of these chips. And basically, I've stayed in microchip design ever, ever since. So my, my major technical knowledge is in microchip design. Now, following the success of the BBC Micro, which, as I've said, surpassed anything that anybody expected. Um, for several years, Acorn's only problem was getting these things made fast enough. Um, selling them was not a problem. Uh, the retailers sold them at zero margin. They would sell them at the same price they paid for them. Um, that was the popularity of the machine, and they'd make their money selling ancillary spares, software, and so on. Um, but Acorn decided, rather oddly, uh, to develop its own microprocessor. And um, this was an unusual thing for a company the size of Acorn to do. Most microprocessors were designed by the big semiconductor houses. Um, but we didn't like the standard microprocessors that were coming in the next generation, the 16-bit ones, uh, such as the Motorola 68000 and the Intel 286, uh, the National Semiconductor 32016, all had technical drawbacks that, that uh, meant we didn't like them very much. And we got this idea from um, the west coast of America, this was American research, into uh, risk computing, reduced instruction set computing. Uh, the philosophy of risk is that the optimum use of a silicon chip is different from the optimum use of a printed circuit board. If you're designing a processor on a chip, you don't want to copy the architectures of the mini computers, which is what the mainstream processor manufacturers were doing. You want to rethink the allocation of resources. And in particular, what you want to do is implement a much simpler instruction set and use your transistors to make those simple instructions go fast. And we started the development of this thing called the ARM, which back then stood for Acorn Risk Machine. Um, R-A-S-C, not R-I-S-K. And uh, according to our esteemed leader at the time, uh, Herman Hauser, the ARM team had two major advantages over their industrial competitors. Um, the first advantage is that we had no people. Um, Acorn was still a company of only about 300 people, and the resources we could allocate to doing any processor design were very small. Um, basically, uh, my colleague Sophie Wilson designed the instruction set architecture, I designed the microarchitecture, and we had three silicon designers who did the chip implementation. So there were five people on the hardware from instruction set to hardware and uh, probably a similar number of people writing software test programs. The second major advantage Herman claimed we had um, was that we had no money. Um, and uh, this, of course, is all retrospective rationalization <laughs> of, of, of what happened. Um, and so everything was, was done using basic homegrown tools. And the outcome of this was 18 months after we started designing this, we had the first ARM chip. The um, chip was designed, my, my microarchitecture reference model was 808 lines of BBC BASIC. Uh, that defined the whole processor. Um, the uh, picture you can see, I, I drew a pencil sketch floor plan. This is the technology available at the time, uh, a data path architecture. And we built this chip. Um, which surprised us all by coming back working on the 26th of April, 1985. The, the history of this chip is that um, Acorn used it in its desktop products, but its market was limited. In 1990, um, Acorn was approached by Apple, who wanted to use the ARM in their Newton product. And but they were a bit worried about the ARM being controlled by Acorn, who they saw as a competitor, albeit a small one. Um, and so 
ACORN was also looking for some way of offloading the cost of maintaining the arm development, and so they set up a joint venture. Um, this happened just after I'd left ACORN to go to Manchester. Now, one of the interesting features of this story is that, again, uh, looking at the typical age around the room, um, you probably never... Who's heard of the Apple Newton? They weren't born in Britain, most of them. Sorry? They weren't even born in Britain, didn't they? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Now, come on, they're 25. <coughs> <laughs> The Newton came out in about 92. So who's heard of the Newton? Yeah, I know the old guys have heard of it. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's only a few of you have actually heard of the Newton. Um, this was Apple's first attempt at a handheld mobile computer system, okay, in the, in the early 1990s. And... Um, they wanted to use the ARM in this. They'd been playing with a different processor, the AT&T Hobbit, um, but they decided this was not suitable and the ARM was more suitable. Um, so they set up this joint venture, ARM Limited. Um, now, even in the early 90s, uh, the Apple brand was very powerful, just as it is today. And it took two or three years for the Newton product to be introduced and then to be seen to fail um, so, sorry, I knocked it again. <laughs> He's going mad. Um, <coughs> but in those two or three years, the Apple brand opened lots of doors and really established ARM as a viable company. By the time the Newton was clearly not going to succeed as a product, um, ARM was well established um, and their success was uh, built on that early start. Now, of course, the Apple story is that 10 years later they tried again in a slightly different form and their second attempt was, was the iPhone um, based around iPod and, and, and the other similar small mobile technologies and of course the iPhone went on to great success and again um, is based on the ARM processor. Um, but their first attempt, even companies as large and famous as Apple um, can fail at product development, it's very difficult to innovate product, and, uh, but that's what established ARM in the marketplace. And in the 1990s, ARM was fortuitously very well positioned for a new development in chip design, which was this development called Systems on Chip. Moore's Law was just beginning to deliver enough transistors that you could think of a chip as something that you could put not just the microprocessor on, uh, but many of the other system components as well. You could start to think in terms of building a product such as a mobile phone, where all the logic, apart probably from the memories, was on a single chip. And because ARM was very simple, for the reasons I expressed earlier, we had very limited resource to design it, if you used the ARM as the processor on a system on chip, you had more resource left for everything else. If you used one of the competing processors, they were bigger, they occupied more of the chip. You had less silicon room for support stuff. ARM was not designed in the early 1980s for mobile product. It was designed for Acorn's desktop product. But it was very simple because of the constraints that applied and because of the idea of the reduced instruction set computer, which helped allow it to be simple. And it was also very low power. Again, this was a bit of an accident. Um, the tools that were used to design the arm didn't have very good power um, estimation capabilities. We knew that we had to design the chip to come in at under one watt, because one watt allowed cheap plastic packaging, which you needed to keep the desktop machines economic. If you went over a watt, you had to go to ceramic packages, which cost $20 more. So we knew we had to keep it under a watt, but the tools were not very accurate. And so we applied Victorian engineering, um, and the processor actually came in at under a tenth of a watt. Um, in fact, there's an, there's an interesting story from the early ARM tests 
when we plugged the machine in, when I decided to do the power measurements, I did the usual thing, you know, get an ammeter, connect it in series with the power supply, um, turn the system on and see what current you draw. Now my surprise was that when I first did this, the arm was sitting in its test board running a program, I looked at the ammeter and it said zero. I thought, this can't be right. <coughs> it turned out the reason it read zero was because I'd not made a connection. So the power was not connected to the processor, but it was running a program. Now, if you know how chips are built, when you think about this for long enough, you can work out what's probably happening here is that chips, on all their outputs and inputs, they have protection diodes. So if another chip on the circuit board is sending a logic one, but that chip isn't powered, then the logic one will send power through the protection diode into the chip. And if the chip is low power, you can get enough power into it that way for it to run. So effectively, the, this ARM processor was running code powered entirely through protection diodes through the other inputs. Of course, had all the other inputs chosen to be zero, um, it would have stopped. But as long as a few of the other inputs were ones, um, the chip kept running. So it turned out to be remarkably low power. Um, and, and that turned out to be another advantage uh, fortuitously in the 90s as systems on chip began to be used in mobile product. And the last number I heard of the total, total number of arms shipped to date, uh, they've now passed 75 billion. The introduction said 60 billion because it was written about six months ago. Um, they're currently running, arm shipments are currently running at about a billion a month, um, which is a terrifying number. And so again, I refer back to the, the man from IBM who thought five computers would be enough for the world. Um, Arm is selling a billion computers a month, and apparently that's still not enough because the number's still growing. Just to emphasize the fact that the Arm was a small processor, that's, that's the processor itself in the top left corner of the chip. Um, the rest of the chip is sundry system support functions. Now, Arm was unusual as a processor company, um, and one of the things that was unusual is when they were formed in the 1990s, they didn't spend the whole of that decade building a roadmap making faster processors. They did a bit of that, but more what they focused on was the problems of using processors in systems on chip. Historically, if you built a a computer with a microprocessor in, the processor would sit there in a socket, and there was a technique for debugging your system that was called in-circuit emulation. You'd prize the processor out of the socket, you'd plug in an adapter, and then an external computer would be able to see all the interface signals, all the address bus and data bus, and you could track the code and debug it that way. Now, when you put your processor inside a chip, you no longer have the option of unplugging it. And so how do you debug your system, right? This was a big problem in the 1990s as processors were beginning to disappear into chips. And ARM put a lot of work in the 1990s into understanding um, how to simplify the use of their IP and developing things such as on-chip debug, standardizing the interconnect, um, designing the processor so that it could be manufactured on a wide range of processes. Uh, so if a new semiconductor manufacturer wanted to build it, um, it was easy to move to their process. And at the end of the 90s, they'd actually moved away from physical design of processors <coughs> where you design the physical layout. They'd moved across pretty much entirely to what was called soft IP, i.e. synthesizable cores. Uh, the kind of stuff, if you've been in VLSI design for the last decade, you kind of assume is normal, okay? Because everything um, since about 2000 has been done this way. But before 2000, most of the processors were, were built as hard macros. And, and there's a kind of philosophy here. Um, 
that I think underpins a lot of, 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 of on the company's success is that it's very tempting, you know, if you work in a small group of clever engineers to design stuff to impress your clever engineering friends, okay? We've all done this. This is, this is, this is what people do. But actually, the market of clever engineers is quite small, right? Most of the world's design is done by people who don't want to have to think that much about what they're doing. They want things that work for them rather than require deep understanding. And so this triangular picture sort of shows you that if you, if you build very complex, very clever things that only very clever people can use, then your market is small. Whereas if you simplify its use and, and, and work out schemes that, that mean that lots of people can use it, then your market grows. And, and that's the thing that I think ARM got most right in the 1990s, was this focus on making their stuff usable by as many people as possible, making it easy to port to new manufacturing processes. And, 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 and that delivered their market size. So, you know, the status today, as I've mentioned, is they've, they've shipped over seven, I mean, ARM doesn't make any of this stuff, okay? ARM is just a design company. Uh, it's their semiconductor partners that manufacture it. And every arm that's manufactured in your iPhone or any other kind of phone, um, a small royalty goes back to arm in Cambridge. And uh, if you multiply small royalties by 75 billion, you get quite a big number. I mean, that's how it works. Although as a company, arm is still quite modest in size. Its annual turnover is still um, of the order of $1 billion. So they're, they're nothing like as big in financial terms as, as competitors such as Intel. Now an ARM processor, because it's fairly simple, um, characteristically uses the order of 100,000 transistors. Uh, the first ARM processor used 25,000, but they've got more complicated since then. Um, so if you just take the processor itself, you take those 75 billion processors that have been sold, then what you get is seven times 10 to the 15 transistors in all that vast number of arms. And, and the thing to think about here when we're, there's an event based around understanding the brain is that 10 to the 15 is roughly the number of synapses in each of our brains. Okay, so all that vast number of arm processors, all the transistors in them, only amount to roughly the number of synapses you have inside your head. And of course, a synapse is a much more functional device than a transistor. A synapse is the equivalent of many transistors. So each brain in this room has more capability than all those 75 billion ARM processors manufactured to date. Anyway, let's get back onto topic. Um, is it really 9.20? Jeez, good, good heavens, where's the time gone? 63 years of progress. Let's think a bit about what's brought computers to where they are now. You've seen this picture. We started with the Manchester baby in 1948. The, the latest Manchester machine is Spinnaker, um, where we got the working silicon in 2011. If you compare those two, then you can look at some numbers. Uh, the physical size is an obvious difference. The baby was a big machine. Um, a bit taller than me, occupying sort of, I don't know, twice the width of that screen. It used three and a half kilowatts of electrical power with which it executed 700 instructions a second. And if you do the sums, then you see that's five joules per instruction. Uh, the, the joule, of course, is also named after a Manchester man, uh, James Prescott Joule, who was born in Salford, which is kind of part of Manchester. Um, the Spinnaker processor, which is a typical energy efficient processor, uses 40 milliwatts. It'll execute 200 million instructions per second. Lots of zeros after the decimal point. And if you take the ratio, what you see is that computers have improved in energy efficiency by a factor in the region of 25 billion over just over half a century. This is a formidable rate of progress. And it's one of the reasons why you can sit in this room with you know, a dozen computers in your pocket. Um, 
because this improvement in energy efficiency means that you can run quite a lot of compute uh, off a small battery. This number is very hard to get your head around. It's a very big number. Um, one reference point is the UK road transport fleet, all the cars, buses, and lorries in this country of 65 million people, between them use um, about 50 billion litres of fuel a year. Right? So if the car industry had improved the efficiency of cars at the same rate the computer industry has improved the fuel efficiency of computers, we'd be able to run the UK off two bottles of fuel a year. Now, of course, there are, there are good engineering reasons why improving the fuel efficiency of cars is harder than computers. Um, I'm still a bit surprised it's taken the car industry so long to get around to even trying. If you look at fuel efficiency of cars, it's basically been flat since the Second World War, and only in the last five years has it started to improve. Um, but that's not the point. The point is this is a huge number, and it's the thing that's put computers into everybody's hands. Now, you might think that's good for the ecology, okay? Saving energy is good, right? Um, but it was once pointed out to me that despite this, computers use more of the world's resources each year. So as they get more efficient, they use more resource. And this turns out not to be the first time this has happened. Um, again, it was a helpful member of an audience when I presented these slides earlier pointed out this has happened before. And in the mid-19th century, uh, Jevons, who was at Manchester University as well, wrote a book called The Coal Question. And he noted that steam engines were getting much more efficient. James Watt's newfangled engine was much more efficient than Thomas Newcomen's old-fashioned one. Um, so you might expect coal consumption to go down, but actually what happened was coal consumption went up. Now, you don't have to think about this for very long to realize what happens. As you improve the efficiency of a technology, the number of places, the number of uses you can find goes grows, and it grows faster than the efficiency. So the number of units with computers, that's the 75 billion arms and a few from other companies, um, multiplied by the efficiency is a growing number, not a shrinking one. And this is quite a challenge for engineers. If you make something more efficient, people want more of it, so it consumes more resource. What's, what's the sort of sustainable balance in this equation? I have no answers to this. Um, what's been driving all this progress? Well, I guess everybody knows the, the basic history of the technology um, is transistors arrived roughly at the same time as the first computer. The Manchester Baby was 1948. They got combined into integrated circuits about a decade later. Um, and then we could print transistors. Intel created the microprocessor with the 4004, which appeared in 1971. Um, again, this was a sort of little local optimization. They had a contract to build hardware, uh, I think, for a Japanese desktop computing, uh, desktop calculator activity and they decided that it was more efficient to build a single programmable device than several different custom devices, and, and that's where the microprocessor came from. And in 1965, Gordon Moore wrote his famous paper um, on the trends in microchip design, pointing out that the number of microchips, the number of transistors you could put on a chip appeared to be doubling. Now, he wrote his paper in 65, and he predicted this doubling would continue for the next decade, i.e. to 1975. Um, but actually, as you see from this plot here, which you've seen forms of before, um, this doubling has continued decade on decade on decade. And if you're any good at maths, you'll know that if you keep doubling um, every two years, then in 10 years you get five doublings, which is a factor 32. In 20 years, you get 10 doublings, which is a factor of 1,000. In 40 years, you get a factor of a million, and so on. These things grow um, ferociously if you can sustain exponential progress for long enough. But of course, 
and I guess the, the, the key point for this talk is that everything hasn't continued on this exponential course um, because if you look at the other plots here, the number of transistors is still growing following Moore's law with some time constant. You can see it's not quite a straight line. Uh, but other factors didn't keep growing. And these were things such as the clock speed. In the 90s, clock speed was everything for processors. There were wonderful marketing battles where you know, Intel said, my clock speed's X, and AMD said, oh, my clock speed's X times 1.2. And, and, and then to keep winning these marketing battles, they started virtualizing clock speeds at the end of the 1990s. Um, but actually, this got sufficiently silly that th there were occasions when the new microprocessor came out with a higher clock speed for marketing reasons, but actually a slower usable performance than the predecessor. Um, past the turn of the millennium, everybody realized that this clock speed thing was going nowhere. They couldn't afford to keep increasing clock speed, mainly because of power reasons. The chips were going to melt. And, uh, and so we saw a leveling off at you know, one, two, two and a half gigahertz, depending on the application, um, and depending on how much cooling you could afford. Because as you put the clock speed up, the power goes up, and so, again, as you see on this graph, uh, the power of high-end processors settled at about 100 watts. Now, in my view, this is a ludicrous power to operate a chip at. Um, I, my principle is that it's unethical to build chips that consume more than one watt. Um, but then I come from the other end of the business, you see. So, uh, so I think 100 watts is, is excessive. And then the performance per clock also leveled off. So what you see here is that microprocessors were improving exponentially following Moore's law until about the turn of the millennium, and then it stopped. And when it stopped, they had to think of some other way of building new microprocessors that they could sell because they weren't going to be any better than their previous ones. Now, in parallel with Moore's law delivering more transistors, the other thing we needed was the cost to go down. Um, and it actually comes from the same effect. As you make transistors smaller, historically, they get cheaper, they get faster, and they get more energy efficient. Okay, so everything about a transistor improves as you make it smaller, apart from the cost of the factory you need to make it, which grows exponentially. Um, and, you know, here's the, here's the entertaining number. Um, back in the 1950s, a transistor cost several hundred dollars. Okay? And today, you can buy particularly flash memories with billions of transistors on for a few dollars. And this is clearly important if uh, computers are going to become uh, as universal as they are today. The cost has to go down, the energy efficiency has to go up, um, and so on. Now, what are these transistors? Well, here's a close-up picture of a microchip. This is 10 years old or more now. Um, but if you took a picture of a modern microchip, you see very little. It's just a, a mirror surface these days. Um, what you're seeing here is principally the metal that connects the transistors together. You can see a couple of transistors uh, there at the bottom of this stack. Um, that's a transistor gate. That's another transistor gate. The rest of the transistor is kind of in the dark bit. Um, and if you look at this, you can make out, I think, three layers of metal. Modern chips have 10, 12 layers of metal. But a key point here is that if you magnified one of today's chips to this scale that you see on the screen, the whole chip is many square kilometers at this level of detail. And again, an analogy I like is that the job of designing the wiring for one of today's microchips is roughly the same scale as the, de as the job of designing the road network of the planet from scratch, including footpaths. Okay, so if you imagine taking the whole of the Earth, trying to design all the roads on the planet from scratch, that's the job you face if you start a new microchip design. The number of wires is roughly the same as the number of roads on the planet. 
So it's, it's a terrifyingly complex um, challenge, only made possible because we've got very sophisticated computer-aided tools to do this. And indeed, most of today's chips, the wiring is entirely automated. Um, as transistors shrink, the complexity grows in 10 years. If you mag you'd have to magnify the chip more to get it to this size, and you'd have several hundred square kilometers of this level of detail to contend with in the design. As we shrink, not everything improves. I've said that cost, performance, power improve, but we now really are approaching limits. I've been in chip design for over 30 years, and at any point in that 30 years, the end of the world was about 10 years away. Okay? There, were, there were problems that meant we could keep doing this for maybe another 10 years, but then this would break. In the 90s, the big problem was we print chips using light. The wavelength of light is about, at the blue end, is about 300 nanometers. We can't possibly then make anything less than a micron. Okay, how can you possibly print something with light that's less than, say, three wavelengths? Well, we do it all the time now. The answer is we print things at 30 nanometers using light and at 15 nanometers. <laughs> And, and you know, the, the big breakthrough there was, the re was to stop thinking of the mask as a straight printing process where you have the pattern on the mask you want on the chip. You shine light through and you just copy the pattern. Now you have to think of the mask as a diffraction grating. When you shine light through it, you get interference patterns. And you need to solve the inverse problem from the pattern you want as an interference pattern to the diffraction grating that produces that. And, of course, you don't need to do it with a single exposure. Um, most of the fine detail is done with m multiple exposures, so it's the addition of multiple diffraction patterns. It's very complex computationally, but we've got big computers to do it on. Um, however, the next fundamental limit is the size of the atom. <laughs> and I really don't know how the device physicists are going to solve this one, how they're going to make smaller atoms. Um, you know, historically, transistors looked like the thing on the left. There was a continuum. You couldn't see the detail. Today, they look like the thing in the middle. The atoms are beginning to appear. Soon, they look like the thing at the bottom, where now you've got sets of discrete atoms. You have dopants. The electrical properties of a transistor are determined by dopants, which are diffused in, which is a random process, at a few parts per million. So if you do the sums, you get about six silicon atoms to the nanometer. So if you make a 14 nanometer device, you have about 100 atoms across. If you imagine it's 100 across, 100 wide, 100 deep, you have a million atoms. That means you want five dopant atoms in there. And it actually matters whether you end up with four, five, or six. It matters a lot. And it matters a lot where they are. And diffusion is a random process, so you have no control. You have no precise control over the number or the positioning. And this is causing transistors to change in their nature, from being very well-controlled, very well-defined devices to rather random devices that have random properties. So two adjacent transistors on the chip, you used to assume if they were close, made together, they'd be the same. You can't assume that anymore. And they're less reliable. <coughs> the failure modes of transistors are becoming very apparent. So we've got, we're moving from a period of designing systems on reliable technology to having to work out how to design reliable systems on unreliable technology as Moore's law continues. This is hard. So um, where's all this leading? Well, what happened after the turn of the century um, will be familiar. Um, all the manufacturers threw in the towel on the clock race and decided the way to deliver more compute was to put more processors on the device. So high-end uniprocessors were showing diminishing returns. Multi-core is easier. It's sort of like cut and paste. Um, so Moore's law continues to deliver more transistors, and so you get more cores. And this is all well and good 
apart from the slight historical embarrassment that nobody knows how to program these things. Um, parallel computing, general purpose parallel computing has been the holy grail of computer science for 50 years. And it's still a problem where there are only local solutions. So um, if you look at a, a desktop machine with a quad or eight core processor, and you actually measure what it's using on a typical compute intensive set of tasks, apparently the measurements say the average number of cores utilized is slightly below one. There are some extreme games that push that up to 1.5. Remember the manufacturers have charged you for eight. Um, most of the time you simply can't use them. So we have a problem, right? Um, and now many core is a kind of marketing issue. The other issue is that if we want to push forward, we're going to have to continue worrying about energy efficiency. Now this used to particularly worry the mobile people, but now it's beginning to worry the high performance computing people as well. And here's why. So energy is now a primary consideration from the bottom to the top of the market. If you go and look on the web, I guess most people are familiar with the top 500 list, which measures supercomputers by raw speed. Uh, there is an alternative list, which is the green 500 list, which measures them by energy efficiency. And if you look at the top of the green 500 list, um, I had to change this slide. I realized it had improved since I last sampled this. And when I looked yesterday, the top of the green 500 list um, is the Shaobu computer at Riken. Um, and this delivers 7,000 megaflops per watt. Now, the next goal, and it's, in, it's part of what HBP is looking at for some of its computing requirements, the next goal of supercomputing is exascale. Exascale is 10 to the 18 operations per second. And if you t do the sums, then that tells you that a, an exascale machine made from the same technology as the leading energy efficient supercomputer will consume 150 megawatts. 150 megawatts is a modest power station um, to run the computer. It's also, in standard electricity pricing, it's $150 million a year electricity bill. Okay, uh, electricity is roughly a dollar a watt a year. In the UK, it's a pound a watt a year, but that's the usual exchange rate for commodities. Um, so this is, and, and the supercomputer people think this is unaffordable. Their goal is to deliver exascale at 20 megawatts. So there's quite a lot of work to do here. And here's a hint as to how you might do it, although it's not a solution. If you go to the other end of the scale and you look at ARM's last announcement of their most energy efficient processor, this is quite a long time ago now, and you go through the numbers, what you find is that this is a microprocessor that runs at about 100 billion instructions per second per watt. Now these are instructions, not floating point operations. To convert between 32-bit instructions and floating point operations, you need a factor around four or six. Um, if you built an exascale machine with this tiny, tiny processor, then you could get exascale for about <coughs> 10 megawatts. And that's what's considered affordable. 20 megawatts is OK. Um, and this is part of my view on, 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 on how computers have to change. As I say, I think 100 watt processors are daft. Um, my view is that we really have to bite the parallelization bullet and build machines that have many more, much more efficient processor systems in them. The fundamentals of designing these machines are quite well known. Um, Simon Knowles, who's a, a leading UK computer architect, um, founded ICERA and is now CTO at Exmos, uh, produced these numbers on a 28 nanometer CMOS process. What does it take to do a 16-bit multiplier accumulate? Well, two, one picojoule with an optimal design. 
Um, floating point, 64-bit floating point, which is the usual reference point for high-performance computing, is 20 picojoules, just for the operation. Now look at the memory transactions. Reading from on-chip memory, one and a half picojoules per byte. Reading from DRAM in the same package, 50 picojoules a byte. Reading from off-chip DRAM, 250 picojoules. Reading from solid-state disk via SATA, uh, 5,000 picojoules per byte. So these are the kind of numbers that you have to factor in when you're looking at how to design very energy-efficient computers. And if you think about how you might design processes in the future, then you inevitably end up thinking about these sorts of pictures. Uh, the graphic on the right here is from quite an old paper um, by Manfredelli. Um, and he was speculating what future different sorts of processes might look like. Um, the one at the top left is a client, so that's the thing you might have in your desktop machine. The one on the right is a, a server processor, and the one on the bottom left is an embedded processor. And what you can see here the base, is the basic idea is that you build your processors out of lots and lots of tiled units. And some of these tiles are memories for caches. Um, some of them are processors of various sorts. Some of them are memory interface devices. Some of them are on-chip communications, NOC um, services. And, and the trick is to work out how to assemble these into se sensible and effective units. Um, we're certainly talking about many core in the future. And one question is, is this homogeneous or hetero heterogeneous? heterogeneous? Um, there's a tendency to think homogeneous because it keeps the design simple. Homogeneous can be done by cut and paste. But there are arguments that that's not ideal. And the client example here is interesting um, because I think you can see um, what he's done, what he's proposing here, and I think this is quite sensible, um, is lots of little processes, the green things on the left there, multiple small processes for the bits of the code that you can parallelize. But there are always bits of the code that resist parallelization in that way. If you want to run Word on this, you're going to be hard pressed to map it onto that stuff. So on the client, you have a couple of big out-of-order cores as well. They're very expensive, they're very energy inefficient, but they do make your critical single-threaded code run faster. And so that would tend to lead you towards a, a, heterog a heterogeneous core. There's lots of interest in accelerators. You can get more energy efficiency out of um, various sorts of accelerator. There's a lot of interest in GP general purpose GPUs. Um, and indeed, most of the exascale projects are really delivering the 10 to the 18 floating point performance through using accelerators of some sort, GPU-style accelerators. But there's also interest at the moment in more application-specific accelerators, and here neuromorphics may play a role. Qualcomm's latest embedded core has a zeroth neuromorphic accelerator in there. If you can find ways to get critical bits of your algorithm where precision is not important and neural networks are applicable, then a neuromorphic accelerator um, can fill a role and make the chip faster and more energy efficient. You're inevitably going to have some form of network on chip. Um, they are becoming <laughs> universal. But the big deal, as you will see from the, the numbers on the previous slide, is how you organize your memory. Uh, because shipping stuff to and from memory is by far the most expensive thing you do. It's much cheaper to floating point multiply two 64-bit numbers than it is to put the result in memory. So memory is critical. And currently, the, the general trend in, in server design is, is still to go for big, high-bandwidth off-chip memories. Um, my view is this, this is actually a non-runner in the future. My view is that we really have to get everything into the same package to stand any chance of, of, of delivering the energy efficiencies. 
So my, my personal perspective is that 3D integration has got more to offer the future of computing um, than uh, Moore's law or, or any of these other approaches. It's organizing the memory. And of course, everybody's talking about dark silicon. The idea that when you build one of these big chips, you've got lots of resource, but you can't use it all at once because if you do, the chip will melt. Um, we can put so much compute onto a chip that if we use it all at once, uh, it'll overheat. So we have to be selective. So we may have a number of, 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 of cores that are in general use and a number of accelerators where we use one at a time, depending on the application that we're trying to accelerate. So these are all important factors. So as I say, my personal view is that 3D packaging is the key, um, and some of that's reflected in, in what we're doing in HBP, both the current Spinnaker machine and the next generation. Um, my, my rule of thumb is that in computing, uh, the energy is the number of bits you move multiplied by the distance you move them. Okay? So, so physical proximity, keeping the stuff you use a lot close is key. And then all memory should be packaged local to minimize that number. That actually means if you're going to package it on the same substrate as your processor, memory doesn't like getting hot. Okay? So 100 watt processors are now definitely out. You've got to keep your processor core down to the order of a watt. Otherwise, the memory will fail. Um, so that's when I win my argument, is when people realize they've really got to put all the memory in the same package as the processor. You may want a few fat cores for the stuff that won't parallelize, um, lots of thin cores because they're much more efficient for the stuff they can do. Selective accelerators, um, work out what's key and accelerate it. You're going to need some very sophisticated software to manage this stuff. This is the thing that's often left out. Um, <coughs> runtime management, deciding which bits of your silicon are dark at any time, and dynamically switching stuff automatically um, into the right mode. And you've got to do all of this for one to two watts for the whole package. As I say, this is a personal view, and if you get somebody from Intel to stand up here and give you their view, <laughs> they will give you a very different picture. Um, and at least for now, until they realize the truth, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of this is feeding into what is currently being planned for the second generation Spinnaker machine, where um, with our collaborators at Dresden, we have very aggressive packaging concepts um, to keep everything tightly together. But if you think a bit further into the future, um, my model of the future is, 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 is you can think in the future of processes being free. Okay? Historically, people have worried about parallel systems because processes were expensive. If we have a lot of them, how are we going to make good use of that expensive resource? Well, they're not expensive anymore. The cost of a processor is a few cents. Um, so load balancing is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the processes are all working. What matters is that you use the number that's right for your computation. And my perspective on this is that the hardware is free, what costs is the energy. So what you need to worry about is the energy you require to perform a computation. To make the machine efficient, you've got to avoid synchronization. And that means, and this is a bit of a problem for my computer science colleagues, is we finally got to abandon determinism, okay? So the, the, the historic assumption with computer programs is if you run the same program twice with the same data, you get the same answer. Okay. That's becoming increasingly hard to sustain. Lots of the technologies in processors that are required to make that happen are very expensive and, and cost efficiency. And I think it's time we just abandon that. And the question is, how might such systems work? Well, okay, do we have an example? Yes, we do. It's inside your head. Right, there's a computing device, an information processing device, which works asynchronously, non-deterministically, and certainly doesn't get the same answer every time to the same set of inputs. But it's still quite useful. Yeah? Possibly. 
So, I mean, that, that's the motivation for the kind of work we're, we're bringing to HPP. Can we use massively parallel computing resources, which are now widely available, to accelerate our understanding of how this thing works? Because a fundamental problem of basing future computing on how the brain works is we don't know how the brain works. Okay, so that's problem number one. And as we learn more about how the brain works, can we use that knowledge to build more efficient computers? That's the computer engineering take um, on this whole area. And as most of you know, uh, this has led at Manchester to the Spinnaker project, putting a million of these mobile phone processors into one machine. Uh, with a million using very simplified neural models, point neurons, we can get to about 1% of the scale of the human brain, or as I prefer to think of it, 10 whole mice. <coughs> We've designed the machine based on the principles that I've just been talking about, um, plus the idea if you want to model uh, very diverse brain regions, then you don't want to wire the machine to match a particular region, so you want to virtualize the topology so that we can connect anything, anyhow, inside the machine. Bounded asynchrony, we don't like synchronization, so we don't do it, and energy frugality, which I've said quite a lot about. And this has led to this Spinnaker machine where we've designed the chip. This is a homogeneous many-core chip. There are 18 identical ARM cores on there. We haven't got the out-of-order heavy-duty processor for the other stuff because in the neural modeling we do, we don't have the other stuff. Or rather, possibly, we do that work on a server outside the machine. Um, and it uses 2.5D packaging, so we have the memory stuck in the same package as the compute layer. And we can do that because the whole compute memory system is comfortably under a watt. So we can stick it in a cheap plastic package with an attractive logo. And there are machines around. Um, to get to the billion neuron target, the scaling numbers are 1,000 neurons per core, which we're not quite at yet. 18 cores per chip, which we are. 48 chips on the board. 24 boards in a card frame and then um, five card frames in a cabinet and 10 cabinets. Numbers are easy. Um, making it's a bit harder, but we've, we're, we're essentially there now, so most of this resource now exists and is available for people to use. Um, this is the, the portable Spinnaker product. Um, pond snail brain size, yes, uh, allegedly. Uh, the, big, the bigger board is small insect scale, I don't think we've got, a, we haven't got a big card frame here, have we? We've got big boards, though, around somewhere. Um, 20,000 cores for a frog scale, and then a single cabinet rack is the biggest machine we've assembled so far. That's 100,000 cores, which is, you know, mouse brain scale-ish. So, um, I've overrun. Only half an hour. Only I started late. So, um, wh where have we got to? Um, point is, processor developments moved very, very fast over the last half century. You know, order 10 to the 11 improvements in energy efficiency are formidable. Um, it's very hard to see how they're going to continue. Actually, that's one of the exascale problems, is we can't... The things that have given us that progress are not available for the next step. So we have to find some other approach. Um, exascale demands that we go further. We don't know how to do that. Oh, that slide's wrong. The green lead is now 7 gigaflops per watt. Um, the future, I think, for general purpose computing is definitely going to be heterogeneous many core um, with all sorts of accelerators, possibly including neuromorphics if we can find the sort of killer apps that, that justify that. And um, my view is that, that the future is much more based on the sort of all mobile processor view than, than the Intel out of order view uh, because of the energy efficiency benefits. Uh, but then I would say that. Um, there's still a lot to do there. On the brain modeling si side, the HBP graphic um, illustrates the kind of problem we're up against. Uh, the brain at the bottom uses about 10 to the minus 14 joules per synaptic event, passing a spike through a synapse. Um, Henry Markram's large-scale, very detailed models use about one joule per synaptic event. So there's a scale, a range of 10 to the 14. Um, the point neuron models get down to 10 to the minus 4. And between there and biology, 
Spinnaker, which is still digital programmable, is about 10 to the minus 8. Uh, Carl Heinz's um, analog neuromorphic is about 10 to the minus 10. And there's still four order of magnitude before we get down to biology. But I'll be coming back to, well, more will be said about this in the next talk, which is from Carl Heinz, but Carl Heinz can't be here, so it's going to be me again. Stop me, no, there's a break. <laughs> There's a break, so I'm sorry I've overrun a bit on that. And I have far fewer slides than Carl Hines has. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I shall do my best. So, um, yes, questions. Thank you very much.